maintenance nerds, in this video today we're going to be talking about proton pump inhibitors. So if you like this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up, comment down below, don't forget to subscribe, and check out our website, nerd.org, where we have all of our lecture notes and illustrations for you guys to check out. So today we're going to be talking about proton pump inhibitors, also known as PPIs. And these are medications that you may be giving your patients, or your patients may be on for some time, and they're commonly referred to other names are omeprazole, esomeprazole, and pantoprazole which pantoprazole is usually in the IV form. And these are medications that we're going to be giving to them for certain indications. And what are those indications? Let's run through that really quickly. So first indication is going to be what? If we have a patient that comes in and they're having some irritation in the stomach, we actually find out that they have little, maybe like lesions on the inside of their stomach, and we call those ulcers, particularly peptic ulcers. And what are the names of the places of two peptic ulcers that we can name right off the top of our head? We know there's gastric ulcers, and there's also duodenal. Right? So if a patient has some ulcers, we're going to give them a PPI. What is another one that we just talked about recently in one of our more recent videos? The patient has a lot of acid buildup or issues with their stomach. They're going to have possibly a lot of GERD. Right, a lot of reflux, acid reflux. And then one other one that we can also talk about is Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. Which has to do with too much gas, uh, gastric juices as well. So when we give someone a proton pump inhibitor, we're gonna be giving it commonly for these type of indications for our patients. But what do all these have in common? Why are our patients gonna be getting this medication for these issues. And that brings us to the pathophysiology. And I really think that if you pay attention to this pathophysiology and you understand this, that then you're gonna understand really what a proton pump inhibitor does, how it works in the body, and why it does benefit to patients to be on this type of medication. So right here in the pathophysiology little section here of the lecture, we're gonna be focusing on parietal cells, particularly, because that's where we develop a lot of our gastric juices that go into our stomach. So. Before we talk about what all these items are here, I want to run through a very common equation that we have in our body that happens in a lot of different organs. And it brings us back to chemistry. And if you didn't like chemistry, I promise this isn't as painful as it sounds. So in our body, we have waste products. One of them is CO2, right? We also have in our body lots of water, H2O. When we combine those two, we get this way, there we go. We get H2CO3, all right? And that is called carbonic acid. And we're not done. Within our body, we can have carbon dioxide, water, it'll join together, it'll make our carbonic acid. Then this can also break apart. And what we can get is our hydrogen and our bicarbonate. And I promise, if this makes sense, if it doesn't make sense right now, it will in a moment. But it's important to understand this because what happens is when we have this equation in our body, this is eventually how we get HCl in our stomach, okay? So let's walk through this a little bit here. Again, we have carbon dioxide here. Just in case you forget, this is water. This is our carbonic acid. This is our hydrogen, which is positive, so it's also a proton, and this is our bicarbonate ion. Okay, so now in this little diagram here, we have a blood vessel, right, that's running right alongside of our stomach. We have our interstitial space here that would be filled with interstitial fluid. We have a chief cell up here. These big orange things, which are also over here, are our parietal cells, and we have some items here that we're going to identify in a little bit as we move through this equation. All right, so now we're going to go into understanding this equation in the diagram here. So we're going to start with our CO2, right? We have that here. CO2 is in our blood. It's going to move over into our parietal cell. Okay. As it's in our parietal cell, it's going to meet up with our water, because that's basically everywhere in our body, and it creates our carbonic acid. Our carbonic acid then breaks into our bicarbonate and our hydrogen. 
You with me so far? All right. So our hydrogen then diffuses over into here. And what is over here? This is our stomach lumen, right? So we see over here, our hydrogen is going to come in. And it's in our stomach. So this right here, as it gets pushed over into our stomach lumen, is called our hydrogen potassium ATP ACE. See that in there, ATP? That means it uses energy, right? So as this pump, this proton pump, pumps out this hydrogen into the stomach, there is viable potassium over here that it takes back into the parietal cell because it exchanges. Now this potassium is just essentially recycled through ion channels. It gets pushed back in so it can be used again. But this potassium, or hydrogen potassium pump right here, this really important pump right here, let's do it in blue because that's the name of it, right, is where we have our inhibiting happening, right, our proton pump inhibitor. But we didn't talk about yet why that's important. So all we know here right now is this hydrogen gets pumped into the stomach, so now it's in the stomach here. Potassium gets pumped in and it eventually gets recycled. But we got to finish our bicarbonate yet, right? We only talked about the hydrogen. What happens with the bicarbonate? So bicarbonate then can get pumped out into our bloodstream right, through this antiporter here. And as it does that, it brings in our chloride. Oops. And what happens with that is it eventually gets pumped in to the stomach and we have CL. And what happens when these two combine? We get HCl. We get our acid, right? Our stomach acid. And that's really important because hydrochloric acid has a really important process that it needs to help out with. Not only does it help us digest and denature proteins, but what it also does is it helps out our chief cell. Let's take our pink here. Our chief cell, if you remember, produces pepsinogen. But pepsinogen, when it's in the stomach, is not going to be active for us. It's not going to be working. So what happens is we actually get HCl that helps with pepsinogen and makes pepsin. And now, when we have HCl and pepsin, we are now able to digest. And why is this important? Well, these are our gastric juices. These are the mechanisms that we use in order to help digest and denature those proteins, break down the food into viable working molecules that we can then absorb and pass as waste and do whatever else we need to in order to, in order to use this gastric um, juices. So why is this all important? Well, if we have a proton pump inhibitor, a proton pump inhibitor, if this person takes a PPI, it'll start to block or inhibit this proton pump. So now this proton pump is not going to be able to work as effectively as it normally would. So because of that, the amount of HCl, or at least hydrogen, that is in our stomach is now not as much. So therefore, with all this different chlorine, chloride in there, it's not going to be able to get together and make hydrochloric acid. So it's going to help decrease the amount right, or inhibit. So what is the mechanism of action? Inhibit our proton pump. And what is the name of the proton pump? That's our hydrogen potassium ATPase, right? It uses energy. And it's important to know this because we said this uses ATP, right? This uses energy. Why is that important? It's important because that means no matter how much hydrogen is already in our stomach, this proton pump does not go with uh, concentration. It doesn't care how much hydrogen is in the stomach. It's going to just keep pushing hydrogen through. It's say, oh, my stomach's at max capacity. It's got way too much in there. Doesn't matter to me. I got all this energy. I'm going to keep firing hydrogen in there. And that's when we start creating too much acid within our stomach, right? We have too much buildup, possibly, of all this gastric juices. And some of the problems is, is that our pH in our stomach is typically 1.5 to 3.5, but if we keep pumping in too much pH, right, and we start making the pH of our stomach not within this range, then we're going to start having these issues like 
ulcers like GERD, that erosion, that effect, that feeling of unsettling agita. So when we have a proton pump inhibitor inhibiting this ATPase, we are able then to inhibit the amount of the gastric juices that are in our stomach. So let's now talk about when we take this medication, what are some indications or precautions we need to take, and most importantly for the NCLEX, what are some of the patient education points that we need to hit on in order to help our patients out? So let's get into that. All right, Ninja Nerd, so now that we have a patient that we think is gonna be getting a PPI, we need to think of some of the interactions that proton pump inhibitors have with other medications or other things that we need to consider. So one of those right off the bat is going to be that this is a category C for pregnancy, okay? And what does that mean? That just means that there is some studies that there, are, it doesn't make any malformations within the fetus, but there is some consideration on whether we should be giving this to a pregnant woman or not. So you wanna keep that in mind. The next is that it does interact with some of our medications like warfarin, clopidogrel, darplavix, and digoxin. So if we have patients that are on any type of medication like this, we might want to consider, hmm, maybe something is going on and we should maybe think of some other better medication to give this patient. Now let's move into the education, because this is where the NCLEX likes to hit on those little nitty gritty things that we're going to be teaching our patient when they're on a new medication. So right off the bat that the medication that we're going to send our patients home on typically is an oral medication. So these PPIs like omeprazole, they're going to be taking daily. So when they take this medication daily, what they also need to do is take it in the morning. And the most important part is to take it before they eat. So before food, right? Very important because it has to do with how the medication gets metabolized in the body so that it can be uh, if the most effective for it. What we wanna tell them is that it also, they may be on it for up to 12 weeks, so one to 12 weeks, depending on what's going on with the patient, the dose that they're on. Sometimes the doc will start them on a, a smaller regimen and then they may extend it. So we wanna talk to them about not only the medication that they're taking it in the morning before their food, they also want to ask, or they typically ask, well, when am I going to start feeling better? Because that's usually what their question is. When, when am I going to start feeling better? When am I going to stop burping up acid? Or when am I going to have that burning feeling in my stomach go away? And that typically can take for any patient around three to four days. Really depends on the patient, really depends on what their diet's like, it really depends if they're being compliant with taking this medication in the morning before they eat. But the things that we want to make sure we drive home with these patients are the really important do not avoid or notify. So first we want them to do not crush the medication. They shouldn't be crushing it. They should not be chewing it, which that's nasty anyways, but please don't chew the medication. And also we don't want them opening up the capsule and sprinkling it. All right. And all this again has to do with this way this medication gets absorbed into the body, it has to go through this into the small intestine, get absorbed, go to the liver, and then do its job. So if we're breaking it down before it gets in through the stomach, then we're just not making that medication work the way it should. So we wanna make sure they don't crush it, chew it, or sprinkle it all over their food. Now let's move into avoid. We want them to avoid alcohol, really important, right? And we also want them to avoid things like NSAIDs, okay, so your ibuprofens. And that also has to do with, again, the pH in the stomach, as well as the mechanism of action. Remember, we're talking about this medication is gonna be going through and how it gets metabolized in the body through the liver. So if we are affecting our liver function, then we're also gonna have trouble with this medication. And the last is going to be notify. So this medication is talking about someone who has an issue with the gastric juices in their stomach, right? The pH in their stomach is not right. And if there's irritation anywhere in that GI tract, what is something that we always think about that is a potential problem for a person, especially if they're on blood thinners or anything else like that? They have a potential for a GI bleed. So they need to notify their provider if they are having any type of bloody stool or if they are having that brown coffee ground emesis, right? And why, why is that important? Because we wanna make sure that this patient is safe and we wanna make sure that there is no indication of a GI bleed going on. So if they're having this dark stool or they're having this dark vomit, that is a sign that we should probably tell our healthcare provider because something else might be going on within our GI tract and we need to get that checked out. 
So Ninja Nerds, that is it. That is our video on PPIs. I hope you like this video. And as always, until next time.